thank you everyone for tuning in. We have a really awesome turnout, so that's great to see. So the presentation is titled The Art of Sales, and we really kind of want to focus in on the subtitle there, which is preparation, usage, and maintenance. So sailing is definitely an art form, and like art, there are a lot of different ways to achieve you know, beautiful works and satisfaction. Um, and sailing's a challenge, and I think that's why we all love it, because there's so much to learn and discover and perfect, whether you're a cruiser, racer, um, beginner, seasoned, you know, vet, um, all of the above. So, you know, in this talk, we're going to kind of start with a little bit of the basics from sailmakers' perspectives on how sails work, what makes your boat move through the water, um, and then get right into using different types of sails, um, the handling systems of upwind sails, downwind sails, and then we're going to go through sail care and maintenance. And then finally determining, you know, when it comes, comes time to replace your sails, how do you go about that? What's the right sale for you? Like, so we'll just go ahead and uh, get right into it here. So the first kind of segment we're going to focus on, as I mentioned, is how does a sale work? And um, some of you may, you know, may have some exposure to this content. Um, some of what we're talking about is in the North U presentation. So I don't know if, you know, how many of you have seen the North U stuff, but it's really great. Um, content on sail trim and things like that. So I would recommend checking it out. So, um, but we'll start with kind of how does a sail work? And you see kind of two, you know, pretty different images here. On the left, we have, you know, a much older, um, you know, tall ship type boat with kind of rudimentary cotton sails that are super, you know, what we would call blown out and, um, you know, probably not very efficient, probably can can only sail very deep angles. And then on the right, we have a really modern Grand Prix um, race boat called Comanche. And you can see they're using, you know, black sails, the latest technology going really fast and, um, you know, just kind of a stark difference there. So let's kind of talk about how, how did we get here and how does, how does the boat move through the water? So the simplest concept is sailing downwind. And like in that tall ship photo, you know, it's pretty straightforward. The sails are are pretty big and deep and they're producing drag, which is pulling the boat forward. And you can see on this image on the left here, um, this is sort of a simulation in one of our North Design softwares. Um, you can see how there's a little bit of lift kind of coming over the top of the sail, but you know the airflow is pretty stalled and it's mostly just dragging the boat forward. And on the right, you can see a cruising example of this. This is a trade wind sail that we make um, that essentially you just put out in front of the boat, you ease both clues forward, and it's just gonna pull you, you know, kind of from a 160 to a 180 apparent wind angle. Um, and so that's basically the most straightforward form of sailing that you can do. So that begs the question, we sail other angles and, and boats are able to sail upwind. So how is that phenomenon achieved, right? We're no longer just pulling the boat, we're actually directing the wind to allow us to sail at some sort of angle into it. And that's really achieved with the phenomenon of lift. Um, and, and most people have heard the comparison between a sail and an airplane wing. Um, and we're gonna you know, make that comparison again here. And you can see, you know, as a boat sails upwind, it has pressure flowing over both surfaces of the sail. And that differential, because of the curved foil shape in the sail, is what allows you to still harness the wind power even when you're at a tighter angle. So that's why sail shape, which is sometimes overlooked, is really critical because having the proper sail shape and having your sail hold that shape is going to allow you to continue to sail nice angles upwind and keep your boat nice and balanced. So the sails are, are one component, right? But if you just had sails and you had nothing under the boat and your sails were producing heaps of lift and perfect airfoils, you would move sideways. So that's counteracted by the keel and the lift produced by the keel. So as you can kind of see in this illustration on the left, we have some force being produced by the sails, which is kind of going in this vector here. And then the keel is producing lift in sort of an opposite vector. And then that creates the forward force that actually propels the boat forward. And really the key and sort of the art to sailing and, and, and properly trimming your sails is kind of harmonizing that balance between the keel and the sails. And you really want to try to minimize healing if at all possible, because when that when the boat heals over and that keel really pressurizes on one side, a couple things happen. One, the boat is going to have a tendency to turn away 
from the pressurization on the keel, which you'll have to fight with the rudder, which slows you down a little bit because you have some drag. And then two, your your rudder is actually kind of coming out of the water and, and reducing the amount of grip that it has straight down. So that's why we'll, we'll get into reefing and all sorts of techniques to make sure that the boat is, um, is super balanced while you're sailing upwind. And this is just kind of another illustration of that. You can see as well when you heel over and um, you know, many of you have, have already experienced this. And I think these topics are going to be really applicable to, to racing and cruising. Um, but when that boat heels over, wind spills out of the sails, you lose your grip, which means you're not tracking as well upwind um, and you have to fight it with the rudder. So we want to keep everything in harmony, keep everything balanced so that the boat is nice and stable and, and sailing upwind properly. Um, and so how do we control that in the sail? So there's basically three main forms of sail control. And I know we're kind of we're kind of breezing through this a little quickly, but again, if you if you want a more in-depth look at sail trim, um, we would we would send you over to North U or, or contact you know some of us during the QA or separately. Um, so the first kind of source of power is angle of attack. And it sounds a little bit complicated, but it's it's really straightforward. It's basically, you know, how is your boat angled relative to where the wind is coming from? When you point your boat into the wind and you're in irons, you have little to no power because your sails are luffing and they're not generating any lift. So when you increase your angle of attack, you start to create a, a laminar flow over your sails and you start to power the boat forward. So then that's kind of your, you know, the gross tune there. And then, so now we start to get into sail trim and, and, and kind of a priority here we, to focus on is the depth in your sail. So a deeper sail like flaps on an airplane are going to produce more power. Um, more power can be great in some situations like light air. And then in heavier air, you may want to flatten the sail out and reduce power a little bit. Um, and then your final control is going to be twist. And twist is basically um, primarily adjusted by how hard you sheet the main sail in. So in a lot of breeze and choppy water, you may ease your main off a little bit, increase twist and kind of spill some wind out or in light air on a perfectly flat day and say, you know, the Chesapeake Bay, you know, you may trim your sail in really hard and and kind kind of preserve that airflow and uh, and eliminate some of that twist. Um, so we'll just keep on moving here. So now, Jack, why don't you uh, take us through using some of these sails? All right. So, yeah, so sails come in a lot of different varieties. That's um, and depending on what what direction you want to sail in the wind and uh how powerful your boat is, um, what kind of boat, what kind of rig, and so on, and uh, what kind of sailing you're doing, uh, all add up. You know, obviously, somebody that sails in flat water, you're going to have different um, needs than somebody that sails in rough water, where you're going to need more power. So um, there's lots of different kinds of sails, and hopefully we'll decode a little bit of that going forward. So basically, as uh, Max was alluding to earlier, um, going upwind is the balancing the forces between the hull shape, which actually does generate some lift if the hull is heeled at the proper angle, uh, the keel, and then the sails actually producing lift as well. So upwind, it's all about lift. And what you try to do is have as you can see in the top right corner, how the sails are in sync. And even the sail that's down on this big oyster cruising boat, the um, leeches sort of match. The overall shapes of the sails match. They're flat. They're, sail they're sheeted in fairly tight. And uh, what you're trying to do is get the two sails to work in harmony. So if they work in harmony, they're trimmed in uh, with similar, just like, a you know, the if you think about uh, um, uh, the rudder on a on a um, wing, uh, if they're working together, they change the shape so that the boat can either go up tighter to the wind, or uh, if you ease the sails and open everything up, you'll go uh, at a lower angle. Uh, you want them to work together, and you don't want one to be too round uh, compared to the other one, because then you'll have the problem of one sail's sort of stalling while the other sail might not be powerful enough. So it's important that they both work together. And like I said, that, you know, in a perfect world, you know, you would have all your sails 
be similar design or designed together so they work together. Reaching sales, it's the same sort of concept. You're still trying to produce lift by the sales, uh, the sale force lift, and it's really important that they work together. So like in these two pictures, you can see um, the leeches. So the sail shapes are going to be the same, but you're also going to trim the sails so that they match. So the, the boat on the left, you can see they have three sails and all the leeches are twisting pretty much the same way. And the same with this cruising spinnaker on the right. Uh, both sails are open. They're both twisted, generating equal amount of power. And then in the case of reaching, uh, because often with the reaching as opposed to going upwind, you're actually going to be going as fast as the boat can go. So this is the maximum speed that you're going to go, but it's also the most force you're going to put on the sails. So, that, so it's really important to learn the balance of how to balance the sail force due to the area and the shape versus how much you're trimming it. And then running sails, it's the opposite, as we were talking about, as Max showed in the picture earlier, you know, when you had the old style boats that would pretty much couldn't go upwind, the best you could do would be to create a bunch of drag and put as much sail area up as possible. So like, you know, in the days of the tall ships, they would have thrown every bit of canvas up and uh, you would have seen top gallant sails and uh, as well as the mains, the mizzens and everything else. And the idea was just to throw as much area up as possible. And even cruising or racing, we have a cruising sails that are specialized for running at deep angles. But uh, racing sails in particular, part of the race course usually includes sailing deep angles. So, or if you're doing an offshore race, you know, such as Transpac, where you're, most of the race is sailing downwind. The whole idea is to go as fast as you can by generating as much drag force by the sail area uh, thrown up in front of the boat. And one of the other things you can do besides having the spinnaker, you can see the little more purplish sail, the pink sail, uh, is a staysail thrown up inside of that. Unfortunately, this visual doesn't actually show the main sticking all the way out there too. So, um, but it would be there as well. So, Basically, in a nutshell, it comes down to two things. The closer you are to the wind, you want to generate lift with the sails, but not so much power that you're causing the boat to heel over. And downwind, you're harnessing as much drag as you can to, to make the boat sail as fast as you can with the breeze. All right, so... Being sailmakers, we can come up with as many sails as we want. And depending on what you do for uh, what your, uh, how you sail your boat, you may take a sail chart like this. Like this, in this case, this is a sail chart for an offshore racing boat. Um, and it's got basically at the top of the uh, chart are all the upwind sails. And the bottom of the chart, in the middle are the reaching sails, and on the bottom are the running sails. The dotted blue lines along the top and the bottom are basically illustrating from the boat's polar uh, diagrams what the optimum angles at a certain wind speed. So on the left uh, axis and right axis of the chart are wind angle, and across the top uh, and along the bottom going in the y direction, I guess that's the, yeah, that's the X direction. The, the, uh, is the wind speed. So, so max, if you pick like 12 true wind speed at 73, uh, true wind angle, you're going to find you're in the middle of the code two jib. So this is really good because from the point of view of, uh, going straight up wind, you can follow that blue curve along the top and you, and it's pretty easy to see that, you know, maybe, at 15 to 16 knots, you're going to be thinking about switching sails. And then as you go down the wind range, down the wind angle at the same wind speed, 
as you go deeper and deeper, you might want to have a jib top. And then as you go deeper, you might want to have a reaching spinnaker. And then at the bottom, uh, there's the A2, which would be the runner. Now, somebody just asked about the code zero. If you look all the way on the left, there's one labeled A0. And, and this is an older sale chart. Um, and nowadays that the upper boundary of the A0 might actually uh, be somewhere close to 70 true wind angle as opposed to 90, which it might have been back when that sale chart was made. But basically the idea is this, is that for all these different wind angles, you could have a different sail shape. If, if you had uh, enough room on your boat and you had the kind of uh, boat that, you know, for whatever uh, rule you were sailing under, you're allowed to have as many sails as you want, you would fill in all these different angles uh, with specialized sails. Now, most people don't have that. Maybe, maybe they only have a main and a Genoa or a main and a jib. So then you have to work around uh, uh, by changing how you um, sheet the sails and how you sheet the sail and how you um, how tight you sheet them. So anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just add one one quick point to this, Jack. So this is a racing um, polar chart here, sail usage chart. And I know there are some apps out there where you can actually log your wind speeds, wind angle, and boat speed for cruising and kind of develop your own cruising usage chart. Whether like Jack said, if you just have two sails or maybe you have a spinnaker, a main and a Genoa, and you know, you're trying to decide between reefs, spinnaker, things like that. So, you know, this is, while this is more prevalently used for racing, it's totally applicable for cruising as well. Absolutely. And everybody should work on their own as, you know, basically roughly writing down, you know, what sail they used in a different condition. So anyway, so, how did we fill in that sail chart and what are all these different sails? Well, here's two examples. One on the left is more of a, a newer Grand Prix boat with a fractional rig, big mainsail. But essentially, uh, all these sails have slightly different geometries, different sizes, and different shapes. And that's how, how you specialize different sails to different wind speeds and different wind angles. So you know, the bigger the sail, obviously, the more force you're going to get because you have more area. The geometry, going back to what Max was talking about in the basics, the uh, or I'm sorry, the geometry, I'm sorry, is how it sheets. So essentially, the sails with the higher clues, as in uh, that J46, the orange sail on the right, that one has a pretty high clue. That sail would be meant for broader angles. And the sail that's purple that's got the very low clue might be used for much tighter angles like really going upwind. So the geometry of the sail does matter on how it can sheet and how tight you can make it at whatever angle. Then the depth is the actual shape of the sail. If you went back to the picture of the mainsail in the, the slides showing sail depth, you would see that the sail is rounder or flatter. So a rounder sail in general is going to give you more power and a flatter sail in more general in general is going to give you less power. And so in heavier air, you might put up a flatter sail and in a sail that's meant for light air would be a deeper or more powerful shape. Now there's limits, right? So if a sail doesn't have its, you know, good aerodynamic shape and it's just really round, it's going to stall out and actually be slower than maybe a flatter sail that actually has a good shape. So anyway, going back, if you looked back at that sail chart, they had a lot of different kinds of sails, right? Well, not everybody has that many sails. And one of the ways that you can, uh, without changing your head sole and you want to sail a different angle, you can actually move the leads around. One of the great things about sailboats is uh, you have lots of ways to adjust the sails matching the conditions that you're sailing in. So if you look at this, uh, at the front of the boat, there's sort of three red lines. The line on the left is basically uh, arrow or on the bottom. The one, uh, it shows where the inboard track is. That's where you would sail as upwind as you could be. 
maybe that's a sheeting angle of something like, you know, seven or eight degrees. And on this particular boat, which is a Swan 45, they actually have a thing called an inhaler where you can pull the clue in even tighter into the handrail to something like four to five degrees. Um, so the tighter you can get that foil in, the closer to the winds you can sail. Now, on the other hand, so you, you have a sail that can go upwind, but then you want to start reaching. And as you ease the sail, you start to lose control of the leech. So one of the things that you can do is go to an outboard lead. So if you look at the top arrow, now that angle is probably double, right? It's probably more like 20 degrees or 18 degrees. So it opens up the sail, but it also allows you to sheet the sail, the leech of the sail tighter, even though the sail is eased out. So you can make the sails more versatile and flexible by changing where your sheeting angle is. Now, the other thing is this particular diagram was made for a race boat, a Swan 45, and they wanted to diagram out where all the different reaching sails and, and jibs tacked and sheeted so that everybody, when they ran up on deck, knew uh, what if they were changing sails, where they could sheet them. So in this case, you can see there's three different sheeting positions for spinnakers and jibs. And there's actually, there's an arrow in the front on the bow where they tack the staysails. So there's a lot of information on this chart, but it's a good thing to know that you can adjust the sails. You don't have to change the sail. You can just adjust how you sheet it and get a big difference in performance. Typically on a, a big cruising boat, there, a, if, depending on the age of your boat, like if, if you think about some older boats, like, um, you know, uh, older 1970s vintage boats or even older, they might have had a metal rail that went all the way, you know, on the on the gunnel that was basically the length of the boat. And you could essentially put a car anywhere along that. And, and even some older boats, like I can think of like the Hinkley Pilot 35 as an example, the track was actually all the way out on the rail. And they didn't actually have an inboard track and the, there was no place on the deck for it. Um, but nowadays, most of the tracks are inboard. And so, yes, for the cruising person, if you don't have an outboard track, you should think about adding some pad eyes so that you can put a block out on the out onto the rail. And especially, you know, if you're doing a lot of cruising in, you know, blue water cruising out in the ocean and you want to sail, you know, in some lump and maybe a lot of breeze, it's a good idea to be able to open up that sail. And it depowers the rig, but it also keeps it, it depowers it and keeps it from healing, but you can also harness that power to keep going faster because you can control the leech better. Like you can see it in this picture by being outboard like that, you're actually able to get positive control on the leech. If he was sheeted inboard on an inboard track and just eased the sheet, the clue would be out there flapping around and the leech totally open all the way up and down instead of a nice twisted shape like this one. Right. And so, and what would happen if you if that outboard lead was too far forward? What what might you see from the sail? Then the leech pieces? would be too tight, right? Just like when you're sailing, when you're trimming the sail to go upwind, uh, you know, and you're adjusting the lead angle, you're trying to balance the foot round with how much foot round there is and how tight it sheets to the rig, with um, how tight the leech is top to bottom. Right. Um, okay. So. By adjusting the leech, you can control that. And the other thing, and the easy way to tell that upwind is to basically, you know, sail upwind. And if the telltales, you can you can kind of take, you can see it with the cursor, if maybe point out the three telltale positions on the jib. Um, if the if the bottom telltale is stalling, that means you need to move the lead back. And if the top telltale is stalling, then you need to move the lead forward because that means that if it's stalling at the top, that means there's uh, basically too much ease in the top of the sail and there's too much wind spilling out of it. So you need to trim the top of the sail harder. So you need to move the lead forward. And if you uh, 
move the and at the bottom if it's stalling that means that the bottom of the sail is sheeted too tight and you need to open open things up the other thing is and we'll maybe we'll talk about it later i think in a later slide but if you're on a cruising boat and you want to have you know maybe you have a cutter style rig and you have a staysail sheeted inside of your uh your big genoa or inside of a a yankee style sail you're going to want the the big sail to be sheeted to the rail and you're going to want the staysail to be sheeted to the inboard track and then that way you have room for all the sails to work together and they're not uh, basically cutting the wind off of each other in general the higher the clue um, when you're sailing it's harder to control the leech going up when it gets too tight, but when you're reaching, uh, it keeps the leech tight, uh, even though you have it eased out. So basically just think of it this way. If it makes the leech too tight to sail upwind, but it makes it the perfect amount of tight as you're reaching. And the other thing is with reaching, having the area up high in the sail, a higher clue moves more of the area up higher into the sail. So you can, even though it's eased, you're still preserving the amount of area that you're using because it's all pushed up where you can control it. So the other thing is mainsails. This is an extreme example here. Cruising or racing, you're going to run into this situation where the, where the mainsail's basically just too big. You know, you maybe you don't want to change the headsail or you're already on your smallest headsail. And basically what you need to do is depower the main and that's with the reef. So in this case, Comanche's reefed up. And uh, this boat is so powerful that actually, you know, some of these powerful offshore racing boats spend more time reefed than they spend with it all the way up. And, and that's especially true with like the, the big eye mocha boats or these big, you know, racing catamarans that race around the world. Uh, they're so powerful that they rarely ever have the sail all the way up, except in a light air, as opposed to most of us who sail around with the full main most of the time. But reefing is the way that you can control the main uh, by basically making it shorter. It makes all the center of effort go down, but it also just reduces the area quite a bit. So the so that the boat isn't healing as much and it's under control. But definitely, as uh, I think uh, Max probably added this one on the bottom, practice. <laughs> Absolutely. Something yeah, everybody, sure. everybody that has a, has a sailboat should practice reefing as much as possible. Because when it comes becomes really windy and people are yelling at each other or you, you need to get the boat under control, you want to do it in a calm fashion. All right. Okay, so now we will get into a few sail handling systems for upwind sails. So um, some of the kind of main things to consider, right? We had a question about, um, you know, reefs just now. Um, so, so that's one of our, you know, one of our kind of items. How many reefs are you looking for from your sail? For main sails specifically, um, you know, there's going to be kind of a big um, distinguishing factor between full battens and partial leech battens. Um, and there's pros and cons to both systems. I mean, full battens are going to provide, you know, typically a little bit easier sail handling, a little more durability, um, but maybe a little bit less control over your sail shape because they're kind of forcing the shape into the sail a little bit. So partial battens would, you know, be a little bit better in, in typically a racing application where you really want to adjust the camber and depth in, in the middle of your sail. Um, and then another kind of big consideration is how is your sail attaching to your mast? There are dozens and dozens of different car systems and track systems. Some slides like this one here is an internal slide that would go into your mast, um, the existing groove in your mast. Uh, many boats have tracks on the outside, like strong tracks uh, made by a company called Tides Marine or Harkin or Antal. Um, so those are all kind of important things to consider. Um, typically an external track will slide a little bit better than, than these internal slides and might be a little bit more durable. Um, but sometimes it's really nice to just made a sail to what came with your boat. Um, and then in some applications, just having a, a bolt rope that just goes right into your mast 
can be really nice, particularly when you're racing and you, you know, you don't want that flutter or chatter in between the slides that um, can sometimes occur. So yeah, I, I would say, Max, the only exception to the external slide um, discussion is old style external bronze or nickel oh, yeah. slides yeah. are are basically um, not going to work with full battens. For sure. sure. Different ways to handle your mainsail. And this is um, a little bit more tuned into the cruising side of things. And, you know, we're thinking about, you know, that the jib is usually really easy to, to unfurl. You know, you pull, you pull the sheet and the sail unfurls. Um, if your main is just kind of left out by itself, um, you know, sometimes it can require two people to flake it and things like that. So there's a bunch of systems out there to make this really um, a little bit smoother and a little bit easier to use. So the first and simplest one is going to be lazy jacks. And many, many boats have lazy jacks already installed on them. If you don't have them, they're really simple to put on. Basically it's a, a block or a pad eye on the mast, and then some lines that need to be, you know, that come down and are adjusted. And um, this system pairs really well with full battens because those battens will just kind of guide the sail into the lazy jacks. The only thing to watch out for is when you're hoisting that sail, um, you just need to kind of keep the battens in between the uh, in between the lines. But otherwise, it's a great system and super low windage compared to some of the other sail handling systems. You just have, you know, some lines hanging down and Oftentimes those lines can even be pulled forward while you're sailing. Um, and so if they're eased and you pull them up to the mast, they're, they're completely out of the way and gone. And then you just deploy them when you want to drop your sail. So this is a really popular option um, for cruising. And, and even some offshore race boats have, have these packs up here. Um, they're kind of like lazy jacks on steroids, right? These packs are, connected to, as you can see in this, this photo of this Hansa here, you can see they're connected to the lazy jack system and they're going to provide a ton more coverage when that sail is lowered down, right? So the sail will slide down a lazy jack right into the cover and then the cover can just be zipped up and you're done and the sails all put away. Um, like any system pretty much on a boat, there's going to be a couple drawbacks to it. One would be that this cover is now, you know, permanently exposed to the sun, um, which Amy's going to give us a lot of good info on what the sun does to, you know, marine canvas and sails. So this cover will have to be periodically maintained. Um, and then kind of from a performance aspect, there's now a lot of windage up here. Um, and for many cruising applications, that's probably not a big factor. Um, but, you know, if you're looking to really squeeze a lot of boat speed and get to kind of your destination as quick as possible. Um, that might be one thing to consider. There are stack packs that kind of roll up and um, get a little bit more out of the way, but overall a, a really nice system to kind of ease, you know, the, the, the handling of a traditional mainsail like this one right here. Um, so then kind of finally for the mainsail, we have what's called a Dutchman system. And um, so this is basically a system where a series of, of plastic pucks are installed in the sail and then a monofilament is run through those pucks. And um, Jack, I think you put it great, you know, earlier when we were discussing this, it's like a Venetian blind, basically the sail rides right down those filaments and just kind of after a while develops some memory and will just fold right down. Um, and it'll, it'll make dropping the sail easier um, and reefing the sail a little bit easier. Um, Kind of a couple drawbacks to this system would be, you know, we don't always love a sail maker pushing a bunch of holes in the sail, um, which is required to install these pucks and filament. Um, and you will need a topping lift of some sort to basically hold the filaments up because these strings are running through the sails and they need to be held up on your rig. Um, so those are just kind of two, two aspects of the Dutchman there, but overall a really nice, you know, popular system for, for especially for shorthanded cruising. Right, yeah. and, and I think one of the nice things about just straight up lazy jacks is yep. that you can actually, if the cover is is independent of the lazy jacks, you can actually pull the lazy jacks out of the way if you're sailing around and you don't want the lazy jacks, you know, flopping around while you're trying to sail. Exactly, 100%. And then there are some of those stack pack style sails, or I mean uh, bags, that you can actually... Um, 
you can roll them up and and attach them tightly to the boom and get them out of the way. But that's, you know, for some people, if you're going for a quick sale, that's a lot of work. You might want to do that. But uh, if you're going on a longer sale and, you know, you, you really want to keep everything from flapping around because um, the flapping of the cover is a little bit of wear and tear in itself. All right. So now we'll kind of move into a couple, um, I'll say a little bit less traditional, but becoming um, very popular sail handling systems. So on the left, we have an in-mast furling sail. So that's a main sail that's going to furl vertically into a mast cavity. And then on the right, we have a boom furling sail. And the boom furling sail is going to basically have a, a mandrel inside the boom that the sail is going to furl down onto and wrap around. Um, and we could talk for you know, well, we're sail nerds, so we could talk for a long time on this, but, you know, easily an hour just on the differences between um, mast furling and boom furling. They both have tons of pros and, you know, a couple maybe drawbacks for them. Um, I would say to kind of generalize it, um, typically in mast furling is a little bit more user friendly, a little bit more straightforward, provided that you have a nice, um, properly designed sail that's not blown out. Um, and just, you know, has a, has a nice shape to it, but not too much that, you know, it's getting the mandrel. Um, so typically that's a, it's a straightforward system. Sometimes you can, if the, the mass cavity is wide enough in the aft end of the mast, you can add vertical battens to the leech of this sail. And so you can see in this one, we don't have those vertical battens here. And we actually have a little bit of a hollowed leech. So if the cavity can allow it, we'll put in some vertical battens into the sail and add some of that roach, that sail area back to the aft end of the sail. Um, so then kind of coming over to the in-boom furling sail, you'll notice in this photo, there is a big, long, full-length horizontal batten right here. And that's going to be, um, you know, kind of a signature feature of, of in-boom furling sails is that they're all going to have um, a bunch of horizontal battens. And so, that does kind of a couple things. One, um, as Jack Jack alluded to earlier, you can typically reef the sail to these battens because they're nice and reinforced. Um, and then you'll you'll be able to support a ton of area on the back end of the sail. And um, in some applications, you can even make a square top mainsail um, like you might see on a big catamaran or a big race boat um, in these boom furling settings. Um, one thing to kind of consider with boom furling is that um, you know, when you're operating the boom, reefing the sail, you'll typically want to be head to win. Um, whereas in mast, you can, you know, usually get away with being off the breeze a little bit and furl it. Um, and there's just, you know, there's kind of some different techniques that you would learn for both of them. Um, they could both theoretically be retrofitted to a boat. Uh, in mast would be a little more difficult because you would need an entire new mast. In boom is a little bit more feasible. Um, you would need to purchase a furling boom and add a track onto the mast and things like that. Um, and then on an in-boom furling sail, um, you'll have your tack and clue fixed in position, but you can actually, um, at least on, on north sails, we basically designed some shape into the bottom of them so that when you go ahead and put a couple turns on the mandrel, you'll shape out and actually flatten the foot. So it does give you a little bit of adjustability. Um, and then on the in-mast sail, it's really easy to adjust the camber because you can just ease your outhaul and the clue's going to move forward and the foot's going to become deeper. Uh, um, so they're both, both adjustable, but you know, you'll probably ultimately get a better, um, more efficient sail shape from an in-boom sail. Um, and, and I think we kind of touched on vertical battens for, for in-mass mains. And typically if your sail slot is wide enough, um, they are quite, quite effective. Okay, so for your head sails, couple different primary means of attachment. On the left, you'll see a hank on sail, a Cape Dory, um, you know, a, a smaller mid twenties cruising boat uh, with a boom here on the jib. And you can see um, these are brass hanks. And so they just clip right onto the head stay and the sail just drops down like a mainsail and hoists right up. And um, we even have some horizontal battens here in this sail to, to kind of project that roach that we were talking about, that all that sail area in the aft end of the sail. So um, hank on sails are, are really straightforward, really effective. Um, one kind of downside is that they take a little bit more effort to deploy and stow because you have to, you know, raise and lower that halyard. 
um, and then and then clean them up once they've been lowered. And on the right, you'll see something that is you know really common on um, a lot of racing boats, and then on almost you know all big cruising boats or you know medium to big size cruising boats. This is a a luff tape jib with a furler. And so basically on, on the luff end of this sail is a bolt rope that is sewn onto the sail and fits perfectly into that groove on the mandrel. And that's how the luff of that sail attaches. Um, so these sails are great. They're super easy to deploy because all you do is, is release the furling line and pull the sheet and the, you know, the jib or Genoa just unfurls and comes right out. Um, easy to reef. You'll see here on, on this north sail, we have a couple of reef indicators that are actually showing you where, where the sail is extra reinforced for extended periods of sailing on a reef. Um, but these sails are, are really versatile, easy to use. The, the only downside is that, you know, if you had to take it down, um, as soon as the sail exit that, exits that extrusion, that mandrel, um, it's then no longer attached. Whereas your Hank on sail is always attached. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of applications where you, you may want one or the other. Well, it's funny because we were joking earlier mm -hmm. about how when I started sailmaking and maybe when Amy did too, mo a lot of the, but most of the boats had Hanks and, uh, but it was such a pain to change the sail that they, people started installing the furlers. And now even on race boats, there's a lot of cases where people have gone back to Hanks for that very reason. Like on the race boats, they like the idea of being able to drop the sail. Like on the right, there is an IC 37, pretty racy modern boat. And they, they like to have the Hanks because they drop the sail and it falls on the deck and it won't fall overboard. And yep. so, so anyway, there's benefits to both um, and drawbacks to both, but it's funny how sometimes old, old comes back to be new again. Right, Amy? That's right. It's trendy again. <laughs> exactly. We've gone full circle. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, just as Jack said, I mean, here you can kind of see um, an example of how you might reef a hanked on sale. These IC37 sales actually have a sort of secondary clue built a little bit higher on the leech right there where the sheet goes to. And then the bottom of the sail gets um, basically rolled and zipped up. And then you just lower down the... Um, Actually, these sails, you don't lower down the halyard, but on some, you may have another tack attachment point where you could lower down the halyard and clip that on. Um, over on the left, this is a really common look, a really common setup. Um, this is a furled uh, Genoa. And, you know, many people sail with their Genoas partially furled all the time. It's a great way to reduce sail area and uh, regain control, you know, over your head sail. Um, and we'll talk about a couple different systems that we can go ahead and put into the luffs of cruising Genoas to really help the sail um, kind of reef comfortably and take up some of that excess shape as well in the, in the Genoa. So now we're really gonna dive deep into uh, furling head sails here for a second, just because this you know, is, is likely um, the sail that you're using or, or the sail that many of you have a lot of familiarity with. Um, so a couple key features, we've talked about the reefing, so you can see on the luff end of this sail, we have what's called a, a, it could be a rope or a foam luff. And essentially that is a piece of padding that is sewn into a pocket on the luff of the sail. What that does is when you go ahead and furl that sail partially, we've now taken a bunch of three-dimensional sail shape and wrapped it around a two-dimensional pole. So by extending the girth of that pole with this padding material, you can actually pull in some of that shape and preserve the rest of the sail and keep it smooth um, with the remaining sail area sticking out of the back. Um, another key feature here and, and something Amy is, you know, as I said, is going to dive really deep into is the UV cover. So you'll see on this Genoa here, um, we have a strip on the bottom and on the leech. And I believe we're actually looking at the shadow of it in this image, um, but that UV cover, and that's going to be the first lifeline of the sun. Um, you know, talk too much about because we're going to get a really in-depth discussion about UV and what it does to your sail. But these are a couple key points, you know, to look for um, either in your current sail or if you're going to a new sail, you know, talk about the reefing with your sail maker, talk about the UV cover. Um, so these are, you know, a couple things there. And then, so we had a couple questions it looked like about um, reefing uh, head sails. So 
This is a really nice diagram, I think, because it illustrates how powerful the head sail, the furling head sail reef is and how much you can reduce your sail area when you reef. So, you know, if you start off with um, a large 155% Genoa, right, and you reef it down to 120, what you're actually left with is a 93% or an LP of 93. And when we say LP, what we're talking about is essentially if you drew a perpendicular line from the luff of the sail to the clue, that's kind of a, uh, a sailmaker's term or piece of nomenclature to designate how far back your sail comes because the foot length could actually be variable depending on where your clue is. So we wanna talk about the LP percentage, how far that clue comes back. And so kind of going back to this chart, when you start to furl that Genoa, not only do you lose sail area at the bottom, but the head of the sail is furling as well. And so you're actually shortening your luff length. So you can um, you know, take a 155% sail and basically furl it to 100% and be left with a 65% you know, percent sail at the end. Um, so a really great way to reduce your head sail area and keep your boat on its feet, which is, you know, something we're going to keep kind of coming back to the balance of the boat and the balance and, of the house. And then Max, that's, that's really a, that's pretty much an illustration of how much area you lose. But in, in general, like this axis on the left is, um, you know, the a sail, size of your existing sail, you probably wouldn't reef the 155 all the way down to 65% area because by then you wouldn't have enough reinforcement on the edge of the sail. You probably more likely would only reef a 155 down to say the 135 position, which would give you about 120 um, area because um, then the, then the clue moves too much and then the, you can't sheet it either. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so generally with, with most cruising guys, we may recommend more of a 140 to 130 LP sale to start with so that when you do reef it down, you're going to reef it down to something like, you know, the 110 so that you have about 80, you know, or 90 uh, area. Absolutely. Yep. And so, that's why. So there's a limit to how much you would roll and because you don't want to damage the sail and you want it still to sheet properly. LP is a is a sailmaker's term that stands for luff perpendicular. So it's basically the farthest point back. If you drew a perpendicular line straight from the luff, what is the farthest point aft that the sail extends? Um, and so, you know, typically that's going to be on a Genoa. That's going to be, you know, right from the clue perpendicular line to the luff is going to be the farthest point back. And, that, uh, and, and that's other, ex yeah. and that's expressed in the in the J dimension, which is a the dimension between the mast and the forestay. So that's what's considered J. So a sail that has a, a J of 100% is exactly the distance where the clue would be right at the mast. And 155 would be 55% bigger than that, which is somewhere, you know, halfway down the cabin house or three quarters of the way down the cabin house on most boats. Absolutely. Now we're going to move into some downwind systems. So a couple downwind systems to cover. Um, start with the most basic here. So that's going to be a snuffer. Many people are familiar with a snuffer. Um, they're really common in cruising. Um, in some racing applications, they can be used as well, um, especially on, on much bigger boats and, you know, even super yachts and things like that. Um, as I said, you know, not a lot to them. You basically have a downwind sail, which we talked about, you know, a drag sail with worker. Um, and, and this hoop right here is going to be pulled down with a line. As you can see, these two guys are, are pulling it down and it kind of extinguishes the sail and collapses it and takes all of the, the pressure out of it. Um, so that's kind of the, the gist of snuffers there. Um, they can be outfitted to a sail if you don't have one. Um, pretty, pretty simple. You just need a, you know, a couple dimensions and, and one can be built for your sail. All right. So now we're going to talk about furling sails and this is kind of a, um, you know, we get a lot of questions on this topic because, you know, I think we already had one at the beginning talking about, you know, code sales and things like that. So there's two main furling systems we want to focus on, and that's going to be bottom up 
and top down. And we'll, and if and if that is completely foreign to you, um, hopefully we clear it up in these next couple slides. So this is a video of a reaching sale or a code sale, you might call it. Um, you know, code zero is a really popular term. And as we can see here, hopefully this is playing for everyone. So you'll see down at the bottom, a furler is being spun with a rope and the sale is furling from the bottom up. And there's a couple things I want to point out. So you can see, oops, ended the video there. Try to pause it a little bit quicker here. Um, as we pan down, just pause it right there. And then pan down into this furler shot here at the end. Okay. So we see the furling unit down here. And that's being pulled with a continuous line. And so that sail is connected right to the base of this furler um, and to the cable that's inside the sail. So when that furler is pulled, it is directly turning the bottom of the sail. Um, it's a great system, very simple, easy to set up um, on a furling sail. The one drawback is if you can kind of see here, this furl is a little bit loose. You can see a little bit of the foot hanging out right here in this sail. And so that means that the area wasn't all captured that tightly. Um, and that's just kind of one of the drawbacks of bottom-up sales. They work really great on a flatter, smaller sail. Um, but you'll see here <clears> in this <throat> next slide, what happens when you're trying to furl a big, deep sail? Um, so if you were to furl a sail like this spinnaker, with a lot of what we've been calling a roach, that's all this positive area on the back end, what would happen if you spun this sail up from the bottom, you would furl the bottom fairly tightly, and then when you get to the top, you'd have a bunch of area just kind of hanging out and flapping. So, or, or it would wrap on itself. Exactly. That's the other, yep, absolutely. Or that area would, would not get furled and it would come around the other side and you'd have a back wrap and a big mess. So, the way to take care of that in, in racing cruising, um, and this has become much more prevalent as we've gotten um, at creating sails that are designed for this type, is to essentially furl it from the top first. And so that way you take all that, that excess area that's hanging out there and you suck it in quickly, and then the rest of the sail follows suit. So the way that's done, and you can see in this little diagram right here, we've got a furler, and a torsion cable. And so the sail, instead of being connected directly to the base of the cable, is, is connected to a little ball bearing device, which we'll show you in a second. So now what happens is when you pull on this furler, instead of spinning the bottom of the sail, we're now spinning the cable, which is connected to the top of the sail. And so as you see over here, as that cable spins and spins and spins, it starts to wrap up the top of the sail and eventually collects the bottom of it. And so if that is confusing, it'll make sense, hopefully, with this slide here. So over on the left, you can see we have a big, big, deep 200-square-meter, uh, um, what's called an easy furling jenniker. And this is on a big 50-foot um, or 55-foot catamaran. So this sail would be a nightmare to furl from the bottom up. As Jack just said, um, not only would you not capture any of this area up top, you'd get back wraps. It would just be a disaster. So... What we do is use this little component right here. And this is the integrator. And if you can see, there's some tiny ball bearings in there. And so the sail is no longer attached to the thimble and the furler, it's attached to the integrator. So what happens is when, when the furler spins, the tack of this sail is able to float freely and not be affected by the furler. The cable is then spinning and transmitting torque all the way up to the head of the sail which starts the furl at the top and sucks the air down lower. And now we'll just we'll watch a little video of that exact sail furling. And I'll run it in double speed here so we don't take all night with this sail. So you can see the furler is being spun with a continuous furling line that's uh, routed to a powered winch. And the top of the sail is being sucked up and the bottom has now just started to follow suit. So after about a quarter to a third of the top furling, we then get into the bottom part furling. And as you can see on this, this easy furling jenniker, it all kind of sucks in nice and neat there at the end with a nice Velcro it up. So, you know, one more time, that torque is up the cable and you can see the top of the sail starts to go. The bottom's still free, 
And then there we go, the bottom follows suit and all the area is captured. Um, so a really great furling setup for, you know, for racing code sales, for, for cruising Jennikers, um, anything where you're trying to furl a sale with some more area. And uh, last point I'll make on this, this sale actually has an internal cable. So a couple slides ago, we saw that little diagram of a spinnaker with a cable outside of it. We've actually been putting these cables inside of the sails and that really cleans up the operation, um, makes everything work really well. The sail picks up right away with no back wrapping. So these internal cable sails have, have really revolutionized the, the ability to furl your sail top down and furl it top down safely. But, but point out, Max, that those sails yep. are specially designed. So it's not like you could take a standard spinnaker and and just put the cable in the sail. Absolutely. That particular yeah. sail that you showed was designed with the right amount of depth and the right amount of sail area in the top of the sail so that you could do that internally. Absolutely. Yep. No, and, that's a great point. Right. Yeah. And the patches are soft and things like that so that the corner reinforcements are made softer so that it spins better as well. Yep. Totally. No, it's a great point. Yeah. So this is our easy furling Jenniker here. And this is essentially the deepest sail you can make with an internal luff cable. Yeah. Um, and so last, last kind of component of, of these downwind sail handling systems we'll talk about is free flying jibs and stay sails. And uh, these will typically be a little bit more common on race boats. They do have cruising applications as well, though. So on the left here, uh, the sail says A0. It's basically a free flying jib um, that's being tacked to the bowsprit up here and um, almost acting like a, a, a Genoa, a really big upwind head sail on a boat where you don't really have a big enough four triangle to accommodate that much sail area. And then inside of it, you can see there's a stay sail right here. And on the right, we also have a stay sail. Um, and stay sails have a ton of racing and a ton of cruising applications. Um, you can use them in, in heavier weather when you're being overpowered by your primary head sail, or you can hoist them inside of a a spinnaker or code sail to close that that big slot between your head sail and your main sail and provide some additional power. Um, and so this sail on the right, you can see, has a continuous furler and you can tell it's top down because it's got that ball bearing integrator connected to the tack. Um, and so that's just a really nice example of a top down stay sail. Um, and then on the left, you have that, you know, that top down um, J0 essentially. So that's that's the end of our um, kind of downwind sail handling. Um, all right, so you've heard a lot from Jack and I. Um, Amy, let's uh, let's hand over the floor to you and get into some really important sail care and maintenance. Right on. All right, we're going to tack here um, and and talk more about um, sort of the sails you've got and what to do with them when there's issues. Um, first of all, I think kind of the most important thing um, when you get started with your boat is to understand the age of the sails um, that you have in your inventory, especially if they feature UV protection. Um, keeping good notes and records is a great habit, no matter if it has to do with your sails or any replacement parts or your engine or your safety equipment. It's always very good to know when you purchased and where you purchased the, the possessions you have um, on your boat. Some of your possessions actually have a predictable lifespan and those dates come in really handy when you start to see failures and you're not sure why. Um, in addition to the age, knowing the quality of the sale that you purchased is always very helpful. Higher quality equates to greater use time and durability where poor quality sales have actually shorter lifespan and are susceptible to damage and problems. Um, we're going to discuss the culprits now that cause damage on your sails. And number one culprit is sun and UV exposure. Amongst recreational sailors, UV is probably the most um, damaging element out there. There's not much good that comes from leaving your sails out and exposed in the sun. UV covers are a great way to preserve and protect your assets. But um, if you know you're not going to be on your boat or use your boat for long periods of time, it's absolutely fine just to take them down and stow them away. Even if you know, even if they have UV protection, but you literally won't be around your boat for a long time, it, it just preserves everything. Um, remember to always check your UV covers and that includes your mainsail or boom covers, 
your roller furling jib covers, your bow bags, and your hoisted jib sleeves. The best UV materials on the market are Sombrella and Weathermax. Both are excellent. Um, longevity and UV resistance vary with latitude, but you can generally count on your UV covers to last you about eight to 10 years. Locations um, closer to the equator, possibly less um, than that, but for average eight to 10. Um, it's good to understand that the common thread used to sew on your covers has less of a lifespan, sort of maybe six or seven years in the sun. And you might need to restitch your cover or points of your cover um, before the entire cover dies completely. Absolutely. Like I mentioned before, knowing the age of your equipment is very, very helpful. And catching any failures early will save you both time and money. At the 10-year mark, even if your covers are intact, thousand percent sure them UV, ray, UV rays are getting through and damaging what's underneath. Is there natural material degradation caused by UV even when the sail is not being used? If the sail is put away with a UV cover, I think you can, if you put it away for a year and it never sees the sun, I think you can subtract that year from your 10 of life. Like it's, it's, I don't think that the degradation in the UV material happens below decks. All right. More culprits include these bullet points here. Um, chafe and sharp things are really important to keep an eye on. They play a big role in damage. Um, anything that touches your sail regularly will have went out structurally. The sail will not win the battle ever. Um, I can give maybe an example when, when you are sailing with your mainsail and you have it eased all the way out, it's great to note where your sail lies on your rig, where it lies on your spreaders. Eventually, chafing will wear through your sail and there are things that can be done to protect your sail, some patches that can be added in those wear spots. Um, another one is maybe if you sail with an overlapping jib and it at times when you sheet it in, maybe touches your spreader or lays into your spreader tips. There are, um, the sail's gonna eventually fail in those spots and you can do things to make it better in those areas with chafe protection or reinforcements in those areas. Um, other things on your boat to watch out for, lifelines, stanchions, pulpits, backstays, reefing systems like the Lazy Jacks and Dutchman or sail pack systems that we talked about, all those things come in contact with your sail and can add chafe and wear. Um, also mind sharp objects anywhere and everywhere on your sail, cotter pins, ring dings, split rings, anything lying against your spreader tips, your steaming lights, radars, pretty much anything attached to your mast eventually will cause some damage. So you just have to make sure those corners are round and not sharp. Um, Sailboat handling is another thing that uh, it's a tough one and it's super obvious, but of course, good crew work is always going to give you a longer life on your sails. Um, when you're sailing along, be mindful of fluttering and flogging. If you can hear them, something should be adjusted somewhere. Do you need more leech cord? Do you need more foot cord? Um, should you adjust your sheet in your tacks? Are your jib sheets being released? at the appropriate times, are you reefing properly? Or as a helmsman, is there anything that you can do, like maybe adjust your steering angle to quiet your sails? Just keeping a constant eye on things is like these, or is, it's always a good idea. Um, extreme conditions are also another villain in, in all the sail care. Um, the wind and waves have a great effect on what kind of experience you're gonna have. Um, obviously more wind, generally equates in more sail damage. Um, if you're out sailing and the wind is increasing, consider reducing your sail area early. Like maybe put a reef in before you need it uh, or put it, switch to a smaller jib before you need it. Um, and, uh, you know, weather and sea state are no joke. If, if you can set yourself up well as the wind increases, um, it, it can make or break your experience. The next sort of, we, we've talked a little bit about prevention, um, but there are a few more things you can do to prevent damage. Uh, storing your sails are, and how you do it, are, it's very important. Um, there are good habits to be had in both long and short-term storage of your sails. For the short-term, it's always good to fold or roll 
any sale that has battens in it parallel to the battens. It's so essential. We get sales in all the time that have sales that are permanently twisted because every time the sale is rolled, it's not rolled parallel to the batten. And guess what? When you put that sale up, the twisted batten is going to assume some shape that maybe wasn't originally intended. Um, sometimes sales have telltale windows or lookout windows made out of a clear material. When you fold your sails, if you can fold around those windows so that you don't bend them, they they tend to crack as they age. And um, it's great to not encourage that any quicker than need be. Um, that's for short-term storage. For long-term storage, it all, it's really dependent on where you live. Here in San Francisco Bay, we don't really long-term store our sales ever because we sail 365 days a year. It doesn't freeze here. And generally it's on the drier side this year and last year, not so much, but generally speaking, we are um, kind of an, an arid environment. Um, but if you live somewhere where you need to winterize your boat, where it's cold and super wet, um, there's, there's a, there are methods to it that that make sense and make you again making your assets last longer. Um, it's best to get your sails off your boat if you're going to winterize it. Have them inspected, and then if they need to be cleaned regularly or um, often, you you should do that. And then stow them out of the elements in a drier environment for the off season. And during storage, it's really important to keep them away from critters, animals, and pests. Love to build nests in dormant sales and we see it all the time. Here we do see, that is something that we do see is people set their sales aside and go to use them four years later. And it turns out there's a family of rats that has been living in their sale. And not only is there a nest, but they've chewed through parts of the sale. So you just have to be mindful of where you, where you put your stuff. Um, boat inspection is something we kind of hit on a little bit already, but it's always good to keep a close eye on all your systems and boat hardware. Anytime you have a situation where damage incurs, it's great to find out why um, and then repair or modify the culprits before they have time to strike again or an opportunity to strike again. Um, and then the last thing here is to know your limitations and your crew limitations. It's important to know what you are capable of and what your crew is capable of. Best practice is to really not put yourself uh, or your crew in situations that they can't handle. Um, it's it's often very overwhelming and we want everybody to come back for more. How often should a cruiser have their sails cleaned and serviced? Again, it comes down to where do you live? Um, I would suggest cleaning annually might be overkill. Um, mm -hmm. I think that you cleaning is not a perfect process. Um, and if you were to do it annually, I think you you maybe shorten the lifespan of your sales somewhat. It's it's you have to pick your poison really. If how do you want your sales to look? If looking if looking smick and sharp and and spick and span is very important to you, a regular cleaning is good. Maybe every four years, three years, depending on what the uh, material is that is being cleaned. Um, and it depends on how much you sail. The service, right. you could visit your sail loft annually with your sails. We don't see it a lot and we live in a, in a windy place, but um, you know, depending how many days a year you sail, some people just wait until the damage occurs and some people come in for some preventative medicine. So um, it all really depends on how much use, sort of also how old your sails are. If your sails are brand new, you don't need to go check in with your sail maker next year unless you're having some serious issues or you have some damage. But, you know, five years down the track, it's gonna be a more frequent visit. All right, what to do once you know there's a problem. So a couple different things here. If, if, if the issue is minor, for example, say you are out sailing with a spinnaker and you have, you've hoisted it and you see there's a tiny tear, maybe the size of a pencil that you can, you can uh, throw through the hole. If, if that's the case, chances are pretty good it's not gonna spread and you're gonna be just fine to keep sailing. You wanna note it, you wanna, when next time you take it down, maybe put a little patch of insignia cloth over it, but it's definitely not an emergency. 
On the other hand, if you put your spinnaker up and there's a three foot tear in it, take it down. Because if that sail stays up, that tear is likely gonna spread like wildfire and your repair bill um, will go up exponentially. So it's good to get out when there is an, a need for some action, set yourself up, get set up as quickly as you can with in a seaman like way, get your sail down and then possibly put it down below. If it's, if it's maybe the spinnaker goes down below, maybe the jib just sits on the deck. Um, but catching any issues early will definitely save you time and money. Um, once you understand that there is an issue, you want to know how you're gonna get your sail into a sail loft, either bring it in or call them up. A lot of these sail lofts have pickup service. We do here in San Francisco, and I think most North, most North sail lofts will come get your sails. Um, if, if you're a cruiser and you don't have a vehicle, that's something that's happens here recently, or often we get, we get cruisers down the West Coast of California. They stop in, have, have, they're having issues, but they've stopped into a marina and they don't have a vehicle. We go meet them on site, take their sales from them, do what we need to do, and we bring them back. And that's not um, an uncommon routine. Um, don't wait to find a loft you want to work with before the damage occurs, because often that takes a while and you'd like to get a show on. You, you want to get on the road with the process. Um, talk to your friends, know where they go, who, what sailmakers in the area come recommended. Have an idea of where you want to go for help so that when the time comes, that's not your hang up. Um, when sail lofts are not busy, it's often maybe a week's turnaround to get your sails back. Understand there's always a queue and depending on your situation, there's some flexibility sometimes. You know, we had cruisers come in, they were in for two days. I had a big long list on my um, to-do of, of sail repairs, but we stopped what we were doing because we knew that they were only here for a moment and they needed as much help as we could give them. So we cut them in, in line and got them back out the gate headed to San Diego pretty quickly. Um, but no, when sail offs are busy, it could take upwards of three weeks to get your sails back if there's, if there's a big queue. Um, so just be prepared and you'll be back out on the water sooner and, and with confidence. Um, and finally, don't hesitate to call your loft service department anytime. You know, we, we're called service for a reason. Um, North Sales is the largest sailmaker on the planet. Um, and likely we have a sail loft near you. We're here to help you and work with you to get you guys back on the water as soon as possible. All right, Jack, why don't you take, take us away here? All right. How to determine what sales are right for you. And that, and that basically, you know, go back there, um, quick, go back to that previous one. Offshore versus coastal cruising and racing. And racing, there's a lot of considerations. Your budget, what rule you race under, what kind of racing you're doing, just the same as cruising. So how do you sail? Do you cruise? Do you race? Do you do both? We can do, you know, sometimes you make sales that can be multi-purpose. That's not a problem. You just have to compromise certain ways so that the sail's durable to be cruising or versatile enough to be cruising but still has good enough performance that the boat will uh, be competitive in a race. So going back to the beginning and talking about how sales work together, our, you know, our goal as sail makers and as the sail designers, uh, what they try to do is make sure that all of the sails work together on the rig so that they're working in, in unison to make the boat go upwind or downwind, right? So, you know, here's three of the most common sort of rigs. Uh, if you had a 1960s to 1990s um, boat, it would have been like this boat on the left. It would have a masthead Genoa with uh, overlapping. You can see the clue is all the way back to the back of the cabin house. This particular customer um, was a local customer here in Connecticut, in Bramford, Connecticut. He was 96 years old. Uh, when he finally stopped sailing. Um, and, you know, you can see he had a fun time with his boat because he didn't just have his main, he had, he had a catch rig and he had, uh, you know, we made this special fisherman sail for him. So he was throwing it all up there and we had to design sails that would work together. Um, so anyways, so that's a masthead 
So that sail is going to be completely different from what you would do with the boat in the middle. That's a fractional sloop. This happens to be a J105 uh, racing boat, but it could easily be a modern cruising boat. Um, Non-overlapping jib, meaning that the clue of the jib is right at the mast. Uh, and the mainsail's bigger. So the um, great thing about these boats is it's easy to have a, a, a mast with swept back spreaders. It's easy to control the bend. It's very stable. You don't have to, you have less dependence on the backstay. Um, but it has a big main and a little jib. So it's easier sometimes to just keep the jib all the way out and reef the main. So for a cruise, from a cruising standpoint, it's more convenient. Now, the drawback to that boat is that the minute you start to sail off of upwind angles and start to reach, the jib is too small. So that's why these boats a lot of times have, you know, little short bow sprits or even long bow sprits where you can put a code type sail or some kind of big reaching cruising sail to power up and go, uh, uh, you know, close to upwind and light breeze uh, or reaching angles. And then the boat on the far right, we talked about this earlier. It's a cutter rig. That's like a true cutter rig there. That boat, it's got a big Yankee style uh, head sole that's out on the front forestay on the bow. And then there are forward forestay. And then there's an inner forestay with a smaller jib. So when this boat's on a reach, they ease the sails out. They sail at angles like, you know, um, you know, instead of sailing upwind at 40 degrees, they're sailing upwind at more like 55 or 60. But the boat uh, has quite a lot of horsepower. And, you know, in this case, this boat's probably quite heavy. So it's probably in the 30, you know, 25 to 30 pound, thousand pounds. You know, it just needs that area. So in this particular boat has a pretty good size main. And then it's got two headsails to really keep the boat going in a seaway. Um, the other benefit to this uh, rig setup is that um, if you wanna roll up the big headsail on the main forest day, you can leave the little sail out and use it in heavy air without having to go up on the bow or try to switch sails. All right, once again, looking at our sail chart, we can, we can make lots of different sails. Uh, you know, almost infinite variety of sales of geometries and sail shapes and so on. Um, somebody asked earlier uh, in the chat session, uh, when would you use a staysail? Um, as you can see, if you look at that sail chart, there's a little purple line in the middle that says 50 degrees apparent wind angle. So a JT and a staysail, you might fly. So there's a little dotted line there that's around the same area as the JT. That's where you might fly a staysail inside of the jib. And you can see that, you know, you can sail it at a pretty tight angle, something like 80 true, which would be an apparent wind angle of 50, you know? So um, how deep could you sail, you know, how deep would you sail it? You know, it depends on the wind speed and what angle you want to sail. But in general, you know, uh, you know, staysails, Upwind staysails with a with a big sail on the outside, you might sail it uh, as low as ten to twelve knots wind speed at a pretty tight angle, and then as the wind increases, you'd start to sail deeper angles, and you could go almost as deep as a um, you know as a Jenniker or something uh, when you got to sort of the 24, 25 knots if you can handle that much sail area. It depends on the riding moment of your boat. Yep. Yeah, and then downwind, um, you know, Max made this nice graphic and you can kind of see with cruising boats and racing boats, it sort of works the same, right? So if you want to sail tighter angles, then you want a flatter, smaller sail. You might, you know, a Genoa is, with, you know, a normal size sail. If you have a masthead rig, uh, then you can do a big 155% Genoa or jib top. But on these new boats, more modern boats that have small jibs, you might want to put a sail out on the sprit, in which case you might do a G0 or uh, what I, this one is labeled as FHG, which I guess is a free flying jib or that would be uh, a helix uh, furling jenniker. Helix there. furling jenniker, right? Yeah. So these sails um, can sail, they're conservatively sized, 
They don't have a huge mid girth and you can sail them at pretty tight angles and they can be fairly flat. And as you go deeper into the wind range, deeper angles and more wind, you then you want, then you're going away from the lift component and you want, and you need more area to keep the boat moving. So in which case you do like a more traditional, smaller size Jenniker, which is the G1 or a full size Jenniker, which is a G2. And it's the same concept with racing sails. Like essentially for racing uh, tighter angles uh, in lighter air, you want to do like a sail that's more similar to a G0. Um, and then you work your way uh, across the scale. It's almost exactly the same. They're just different sizes and, and so on for racing. Because of course, under racing rules, you're, you're allowed different sail areas for different kinds of boats to achieve a certain rating. Yeah. Uh, Max made this chart up to help himself uh, sort of determine what kind of sail and what kind of handling it would need. And so, Max, why don't you explain this real yeah, quick? Yeah, so, I mean, it's not meant to, you know, dissect this chart really, but kind of the, the key takeaway here is that with all of those different sails we just saw here, all these different size sails, we have all sorts of different systems that can be used, whether it's a top-down sail with an internal cable or, you know, a snuffed sail. These sails can be snuffed. You know, what material are they made out of? Is it polyester? Is it nylon? Can they support a permanent UV cover and be left up all the time? So these are just the kind of questions that when you're looking at, you know, do I want to add that additional sale? Um, you know, kind of what's going to be around that sale? What's the ensemble supporting it? Is it, you know, snuff or furling UV cover? Um, so these are just things to really talk to your sailmaker about and kind of kind of dive deeper into. All right, so kind of the last part of this and um you know this is the part that we deal with every day max and i dan uh amy not as much she just fixes them but uh she also tries to sell some occasionally i think <laughs> but basically when you come to us basically you need you have a lot of decisions to make what kind of rig do you have how many sales do you want to have how do you sail what are the performance characteristics of your boat and so on. So all of those things come together. To what's your budget? How long do you expect the sales to last? All those things add up and you have to kind of talk it through with somebody that is familiar with all the different kinds of performance levels of sale fabrics and construction that that sales are made of. So, you know, when I started sale making crosscut was the sort of standard, you know, basically parallel panels uh, you know, oriented perpendicular to the loads. Um, this is, you know, this goes back to the 1950s and, uh, you know, actually, you know, maybe even to Egypt, but essentially it's the same idea um, uh, you're making and you're adding shape into the sail. Each of those seams has a curved edge and like, you know, much like making a dress or something else, and you want to put shape into the um, whatever you're making, you put curves in there and that's what determines the shape of the sail. So that's how you shape it on all these seams. And then um, basically it's a pretty efficient way to build it, to fill the area because you can essentially just move the, you know, fill the panels all the way from head to head to, to foot and uh, fill the area pretty quickly. But the, the down, uh, the drawback to this construction method is it doesn't actually handle the loads uh, as well as it could. So you have to make a heavier cloth to handle all of these different loads um, than you would really like to make. So the, and this is typically woven cloth. So another reason that you have to make it a little heavier is that for the weave to be tight enough so that it's handling all the loads and so on, uh, then it just it needs to be heavier and it needs to stay woven tightly. So kind of the next evolution from there that we started, we really learned to start to do with sort of the 1980s into the early 90s, the state of the art was tri-radial, which is on the right. And essentially we figured out that if you could make the cloth in such a fashion that the yarns went the lengthwise direction of the cloth, you could actually cut the panels so they match the loads of the sail in a more targeted method. So therefore, 
you could actually make a lighter sail that held its shape better because now all of a sudden the loads are addressed um, in a better, in a more efficient fashion by the sail. And eventually when people started making uh, load path style sails, they just took that to the next step, right? Like uh, essentially they were able to lay the yarns in the load patterns. And that's the next step from what radial would be. So on the left, laminate sails, those were basically the next step from a woven sail and performance. And that, and so you could make a sail lighter and uh, stronger and hold its shape better uh, by making a laminated cloth. And essentially starting in the 1980s, if people remember the garbage bag sails of the America's Cup, back in the in the 80s and even the late 70s this was the state of the art all through the sort of 80s and 90s and early maybe even early 2000s this was sort of state of the art for cruising and racing and basically you take woven layers of material uh, and and bond them together making a sandwich with mylar in the middle so the mylar handles some of the weird offloads because it's unidirectional and the woven layers on the outside, you could put in the primary directions. Uh, and But because you have the loads dressed better, uh, you could make it lighter and stronger. So like when you got to these bigger style boats, you know, if you were making a cross cut for this particular kind of boat, you could probably save 20% of the weight of the sail, which is a big deal on a big sail like this. The other thing about laminate cloths is that you could you could change up the, the the very fibers. So if you look back at a Dacron sail, really woven cloth, your only option is polyester or nylon. Uh, nylon you wouldn't use in an upwind sail. If we use a downwind still primarily, but upwind sails, uh, Dacron or polyester is very stretchy for its weight. It's very durable and it's very long lasting, but but it's heavy and it's stretchy. So uh, by going to laminates, you were able to experiment with different materials. So, so in this case, this particular sail is probably made out of Dyneema spectra. Those are the you know name of the same fabric or the same fiber. And it's very low stretch. It's very good in UV and very good in flex. And it's perfect for cruising applications. So for big, offshore cruising boats, even super yachts, um, these would be the sails that we would have made up until five or six years ago, until we started to perfect the more molded sails that would be the next step. So uh, load path uh, sails um, or string sails are basically a variation of a laminate sail. Every single kinds of those sails is basically uh, a laminate cloth, but instead of being made uh, on a roll in a factory where all the, you know, the roll of cloth is exactly the same all the way through, a uh, load path style sail is made by, by manufacturing the sail cloth at the same time that you make the sail. That way you can target all the yarns in the right directions more exactly, but it's still basically a laminate sail. Like it's mylar sandwiching, uh, or mylar with woven layers on the outside, sandwiching some kind of Kevlar or carbon on the inside, which is a lot lighter than sewing together panels, but uh, it is still basically prone to the same problem, which it has mylar inside. And eventually that mylar layer is gonna start to crack and fall apart. And the, the particular problem with load path style sails is that the way they make the sails, you know, basically as they build it, they build the make the cloth at the same time. The glues that they use to assemble uh, the sail is not even as durable as the glue that's in a triradial laminate style sail. So they're sort of a ticking time bomb and it's more apt to moisture problems and so on as they age. So that's one of the reasons why if people remember 3DL, which was our version of a string sail that was actually molded. Um, we got away from that and we decided not to make that product anymore because we didn't want to have mylar 
And that takes us to 3DI, which is our top of the line product. Uh, here's a sail being built on the three-dimensional mold. And these sails aren't uh, made like 3DL was or like a string sail was. It's basically, instead of being mylar with yarns and mylar, these sails have no mylar. They're just load-bearing fibers and adhesive, and that's it. It's more like a composite. And so uh, instead of laminating the sail on the mold, it's basically a composition, just like a boat hull. It's basically the same concept as making a boat hull, but with a super thin membrane on the outside, composite material that's very flexible. So the, the, the great thing about these sails is they're super strong for their weight. They hold their shape better than any other sail for its weight. And because it doesn't have mylar, you don't have any of the lamination issues that you do with uh, even a laminate paneled sail over time. We've come to the conclusion of our presentation. We wanted to say a big, huge shout out and congrats to Cole Brower, who just completed um, her race sailing around the world. Um, and North Sales is is really promoting, you know, sail like a girl because we have some women doing amazing things in the sport of sailing and it's something to be celebrated. Write down our uh, emails. It's very easy for any of us. It's usually our first name dot last name at northsales.com. Give us a call um, or shoot us an email if, with your questions and uh, we'll try to get as many answered as we can. Absolutely. And reach out to your local lofts as well. Um, we have lofts all over the West Coast, East Coast, and, um, you know, really just want to help people get on the water and, and um, you know, get the most out of their sailing experience.